here's Alice. Is my wife here? Ah, good. Thank you for coming, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, John. It's always nice to have an introduction by you. There, you make such nice introductions. Hundred years ago, there were no broadcast engineers conferences. There were no radio conferences of any kind. Good evening, Carl. Wonderful. Good to see you. I would have been disappointed if you hadn't been here. Carl Smith. In fact, a hundred years ago, there was no radio, period. How long is a hundred years? It's a century. My talk will take a micro century. That's a little less than an hour. So, a hundred years is roughly one million hours. A hundred years ago, in 1882, there was Morse's telegraph, there was Edison's incandescent light, but no radio. A few years earlier, in 1873, James Clerk Maxwell, a physics professor at Cambridge University, England, had published a book providing the first unified theory of electricity and magnetism. <clears throat> in it, he suggested that light was electromagnetic in nature and that electromagnetic waves of greater wavelength might be possible. However, most scientists were skeptical, and some even attacked his views. But a few years later, in 1886, a physics professor at Karlsruhe, Germany, began some experimental studies of dielectric materials which led him to schemes for producing electrical oscillations of long wavelength compared to light. And in the following year, he constructed and tested the first radio transmitter and receiver. His demonstration vindicated Maxwell's theory, and things began to turn in his favor after Hertz's demonstration. Heinrich Hertz was the father of radio, but his system remained a laboratory curiosity until 1894, when a young Italian, Guglielmo Marconi, vacationing in the Alps, chanced upon a magazine article describing Hertz's experiments. Wondering if Hertz's spark system could be utilized to send messages across space, Marconi became obsessed with the idea. He cut short his vacation and rushed home to Bologna. And in some rooms on the upper floor of his parents' spacious home, he assembled apparatus to repeat Hertz's experiment and succeeding in this went on to make improvements by adding tuning coils and large antenna and ground systems so that at longer wavelengths he could send signals over large distances. In 1901, he demonstrated radio transmission across the Atlantic Ocean. Ship to shore communication systems followed Prior to that time, a ship at sea was completely isolated. Disaster could strike without anyone on the shore or on other ships being aware that anything had happened. Marconi changed all that, and his name became synonymous with radio, or wireless, as it was then called. Radio transmitters <clears throat> used spark, and everything was in Morse code. After World War I came vacuum tubes, continuous waves, voice modulation, 
and the first broadcast stations, KDKA, WGY, WGN, WOR, WFAA, WBAP, KFI, KPO, and many, many others. Then came FM and television broadcasting, both developing rapidly after World War II. After Sputnik came satellites, particularly ones in the Clark or geostationary orbit, equivalent to having your TV antenna on an invisible tower 22,000 miles high. October 4 of this year is the 25th anniversary of Sputnik 1. I've heard rumors and speculation that the Russians are planning something big and spectacular, like putting up a 100-man space station, correction, 100-person space station with rooms for visitors. It will be called the Comrade Hilton. For European visitors, it will have such amenities as borscht and vodka. For American visitors, it will have caviar flavored jelly beans. <laughs> so now we have AM, FM, ground based TV, satellite TV, we have broadcasting. We have narrow casting. We have cable at radio wavelengths and with optical fibers, cable at light wavelengths. We have a global network of communication and broadcasting systems with new developments on an almost daily basis. And it all has come from Heinrich Hertz's epic experiments in Karlsruhe 95 years ago. Let's take a look at uh, what Hertz used. This is a diagram of his transmitter, spark transmitter, consisting of a battery, spark coil, spark gap, dipole antenna, end loaded dipole antenna, receiver, a loop receiver. When this was transmitting, he could get sparks on the receiver loop over here so that this was a complete uh, complete system. Working at a wavelength of five meters, Hertz constructed the first radio transmitter, the first dipole antenna, the first radio loop which acted as his receiver. It was simple and impressive. And I have constructed for this talk a replica of the Hertz transmitter over here, making it as authentic as possible, even to the rubber bands that were used. Hertz held things together with rubber bands. I will uh, talk more about this a little later. But uh, I would like to say that uh, this one is low power. It only puts out about, uh, well, less than 100 milliwatts. I have here a small spark coil, uh, Model T Ford spark coil. And uh, Hertz used a Rumkopf coil, which was used for um, exciting gaseous uh, ignition tubes. There was a lot of work going on on gaseous ignition back in, in those days. And his was much more powerful than this one. but. Uh, what he did was, um, with his thank you, John, with his loop receiver, he turned on the transmitter, and then with the loop, got a spark here. When he turned this horizontal, it cut out. That demonstrated that he had polarization, a polarized wave. Backing away, he could see that it decreased in strength. And he did many other experiments. He um, 
reflected the waves uh, from large reflectors. He built a large dielectric prism and refracted the waves through. He showed that these waves that he was generating had all of the same properties of light, except that the wavelength was a million times longer. Beautiful experiment. Hertz did a tremendous amount of theoretical work leading up to this. Uh, just uh, reams of mathematics uh, in one of his books. So that he was well grounded in the theory, he knew what he was doing, and it was uh, an absolutely epic experiment. <clears throat> uh, looking at that, you'd prob you would say that now probably we wouldn't build a transmitter like this, but you're wrong. There are over 100 million Hertzian spark transmitters, identical, identical in principle to this one in operation in the United States today. We usually call them ignition systems. And every gasoline engine has one. <clears throat> it has the battery, the interrupter, the spark coil, uh, has the spark gap, and the resonant radiating system, instead of being a dipole, is a loop. The ignition harness uh, makes a, a beautiful antenna system. This is the modern version of the Hertz transmitter. Before Hertz, there was no radio. After it, think of all that has resulted. Yet in 1887, who could have foreseen what these brass rods and brass balls and metal cans might lead to. A Senator Proxmire would probably have given Hertz's experiment a Golden Fleece Award <laughs> as a complete waste, complete waste of time and money. Fortunately, there was no Senator Proxmire involved at that time, or you guys would be out of a job now. <laughs> <laughs> this concludes phase one of my talk. It's the historical introduction. It has been suggested that I include a little theory, but to please avoid vector analysis tensors and second order differential equations. So as phase two of my talk, I want to discuss antennas in ways that may be familiar and also in ways that may not. In my book, Antennas, published in 1950, still in print and going strong, I define an antenna as a transition region between a guided wave and a space wave, or vice versa. You take a transmission line, open it up. It's a small fraction of wavelength spacing here, so the wave stays with it, is guided. You open it up, so this is a wavelength or more. Most of the radi wave is radiated. So over here, you have a space wave. Here you have a, spa here you have a guided wave along the transmission line. Here you have a wave radiating out into space. It's radiation. It's consists of radio photons. So this system is a electron-photon transition device. And the region between the guided wave and the space wave, the transition region, is the antenna. Now, if you arrange things so that the dimension, the spacing between the wires, the ratio of that to the diameter of the conductors is a constant. As you spread them out, you see the characteristic impedance of the transmission line remains constant. And if you make this big enough so you get no reflection off the end, you've got a flat line, very broad band, beam antenna out this way, 
uh, giving having a an impedance or actually a radiation resistance equal to the characteristic impedance or resistance of that transmission line. Now, how big a frequency range could a system like this uh, cover? Well, uh, a somewhat more practical, more compact version is shown here. I've taken the conductors and brought them around here this way to reduce diffraction off the end. And in this system, in this antenna, if the dimension D here is um, no greater than a quarter wavelength at the long wavelength end, and this is no greater than a tenth of a wavelength at the short wavelength end, then taking the ratio of those two wavelengths and assuming that D over S is, uh, say, 250, this antenna would have a bandwidth, an impedance bandwidth, of uh, 100 to 1, a very broad band antenna. At the long wavelength end, this would be a quarter wavelength, and at the short wavelength end, this would be a tenth of a wavelength. Continuing our discussion of antennas in a very general way, let me show an antenna that's uh, kind of uh, schematic. Uh, looks like a horn antenna. OK, that's all right. The important thing is, is that on the left side here, wait a minute. Yeah, that's left. Um, we have a circuit element. Two terminals over here. The antenna looks like a circuit element. We're dealing with electrons on conductors. Over on this side, we have a space wave. We have radiation. We have photons. The important characteristic is, a, and is an antenna pattern. The antenna is the transition region. It interfaces a circuit in space. Now, to describe that antenna pattern can be rather uh, tedious. It can take a lot, require a lot of information. Here's a antenna pattern: main lobe, side lobes, back lobe, with a coordinate system. And in order to specify this uh, pattern completely, we need to specify two components of the electric field: one in the theta direction, one in the phi direction, as a function of theta, phi, and distance. We also need to specify the phase difference between those two fields so for all positions over a sphere. And if we take the total field, the squares of the total field, divided by its maximum value, integrated over a sphere, or 4 pi stair radians, we get what's called a beam solid angle, which is a scalar quantity that's very useful in describing the antenna pattern. There's a simpler way to get an approximation to this, that if you have a typical antenna pattern, you can take a cut through the theta plane and one through the phi plane and get two half power beam widths, take their product, that's very nearly equal to this beam solid angle omega sub a. It's an approximation, but surprisingly is usually better, much better than 1 dB from the exact value that you might get after a week's calculating with a big computer. Here is that relation. Now, if we divide that beam solid angle into 4 pi, we get what's called the directivity. And if your antenna is lossless, we call that the gain. If you don't want to work in stair radians, you can convert that to square degrees, 41,253 square degrees in a sphere. And then you can express your half power beam angles in degrees. For example, you have a directional antenna, symmetrical pattern with a half power beam width of 10 degrees in the two principal planes. That gives you 100 in the denominator, a gain of uh, 
413 or 26 dB. If you have a broadcasting antenna, omnidirectional, 360 degrees in one plane and 8 degrees, say, in the vertical, uh, you get 14.3 as the gain or 12 degrees. It's a very versatile, useful relation. Going back now to the radiation patterns in a more complete uh, discussion. The radiation patterns um, are three-dimensional. We have to have a lot of information. But as you saw, we can get a very simple quantity, a scalar quantity, which is extremely useful. It tells us a lot about the antenna. From this, we can get the directivity and the gain. And there is another quantity that we will talk about in a moment, the effective aperture of the antenna. These are all related to the field side of the antenna. On the circuit side, the input side, if you're transmitting, we have uh, an impedance. The important part of that is the radiation resistance because you can usually tune out the reactants. And you also have a temperature. Very important is the temperature of that radiation resistance. So those are the input quantities, T and R, R and T. Now, I'd like to demonstrate to you that the radiation resistance of an antenna depends on the antenna pattern. It's a function of the antenna pattern. The input part of the antenna is uh, simply I squared R, where R is the radiation resistance at the terminals, and I is the terminal current. That's the power radiated. If all this, if there's conservation of power, we're not losing any anywhere, then out somewhere on a big sphere or big surface, we integrate over that closed surface, we should also calculate the same power. This is the pointing vector, and that's given by the field squared over the impedance of space, and we can rewrite it in terms of the maximum value, where this expression here is that pattern, um, beam solid angle omega sub A. And if I make an assumption about the maximum field uh, being equal to, proportional to the antenna current and inversely proportional to the distance, some constant, we get this relation in the box that the radiation resistance of the antenna is proportional to the beam solid angle. There's the impedance of space, and this is a constant. Z is uh, 377 ohms, the impedance of space. If I make some assumptions about K and the fact that this antenna is isotropic, that is non-directional, the radiation resistance comes out as 120 ohms. So <clears throat> keep in mind that radiation resistance depends on the pattern. They're, they're related. The antenna is the coupling device. Now, here is uh, this directivity expression again. But I want to talk about these beam angles in a little different way. These two angles, the half power beam widths, are also approximately resolution angles. If you have two objects in space and your half power beam width is less than the separ angular separation, you can separate them. But if your half power beam width is more than that, you cannot. So these are approximately resolution angles, and therefore the beam solid angle is a solid resolution angle. And dividing that into 4 pi, we get a number n, which is the number of sources that the antenna can resolve in the sky. So the directivity of an antenna is equal or the gain if it's lossless, the gain of an antenna is equal to the 